Chapter Twelve of the Bells of San Juan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bells of San Juan by Jackson Gregory. Chapter Twelve. Wavering in the Balance. Ignacio Chavez, waiting to ask no questions, had raced away through the darkness to beat out a wild alarm upon his bells. Later he would learn how many were dead and would set the captain mourning. But already had San Juan poured out her handful of citizens upon the street. "'Keep those men where they are,' called Tom Cutter to Strove. "'Every damned one of them. There'll be an answer wanted for tonight's work. Get a doctor, somebody, Patton or Miss Page.' Candles were brought. Presently a lamp was found and set on the bar. The curious began to desert Strove and his prisoners outside, and crowd about Cutter and the two forms lying still in the corner. Kid Rickard, cursing now and then, had dragged himself a little away and grew quiet, half propped up against the wall. Strove, as the fire of faggots and grass began to burn low, commanded Galloway to lead the way back into the barroom, and herded five other men after him. The shotgun promising a mutilated body to any man in them who sought to run for it. Nunez is dead, reported a deputy sheriff, getting up from his knees. Norton is alive, and that's about all, a shot along the side of the head. He turned slowly toward Galloway, who, with steady hands and a face set in hard, inscrutable lines, was pouring himself a generous glass of whiskey. Looks like you'd got him, Jim, he said brashly, his eyes glittering, and it looks like I'd got you where I want you, by God. Galloway drank his whiskey and made no reply. He was thinking, thinking fast. His eyes were never still now, but roved from Rod Norton's white face to the faces of Tom Cutter, Strove, and the other men gathering in the room. Born upon one of the Casablanca's doors, Norton was carried to Strove's hotel, the nearest place where an attempt could be made to care for him. Word came in that Virginia Page had been summoned upon one of her rear calls and was in Las Estrellas. Patton, however, would be on hand in a moment. It was suggested that Kid Rickard also be carried to the hotel, but he himself asked to be left where he was until Patton came. Cutter raised no objection. It was clear the kid was too badly hurt to think of making an escape were such his desire. Galloway and Antone alone were put under arrest. The others merely advised to be on hand if they were wanted later. Galloway coolly demanded the charge against him. Resisting an officer as good as any right now, snapped Carter. As Quiet claimed the town again, Caleb Patton became the most important figure in San Juan. At such moments he seemed to swell visibly. He drove the curious from the room while he examined the unconscious sheriff, and when he had finished, merely shook his head, looked grave, and refused to commit himself. He ordered Norton undressed and put to bed went down the street to see Kid Rickard, probed the wound in the upper chest, ordered him to bed, and returned to Norton at the hotel. Well, asked John Engle, who had arrived, talked with Straub, and now looked anxiously to Patton. Patton shrugged. Heavy caliber bullet ripped along the side of his head, he said thoughtfully. I am going to make a second examination now. Doubtless, just the shock stunned him. That or striking his head as he pitched forward. There's another slight wound, a scalp wound, showing where his head hit as he fell. A moment later, Tom Cutter came in hastily, stood for a little staring with frowning, troubled eyes at the quiet form on the bed, and went away, tugging at his lip, his frown deepening. He had his hands full tonight, had Tom Cutter, and no one but himself knew how he wanted Rod Norton to tell him just what to do to show him the way to make no mistake. Leaving the room, he had gone no further than the front door when he swung about and returned. "'May I have a word with you, Mr. Engle?' he asked. Engle nodded and followed him silently. Out in the street, in the full light of Straub's porch lamp, Cutter stopped, glancing about him to make sure that he was not overheard. "'You know all about the shooting of Brocky Lane up in the mountains,' he said hurriedly. "'Rod told me you did. Well, I just gathered in Moraga. Moraga, muttered Engle. "'He's seen Galloway, then and told him about our knowing the rifles were caked in the old caves. "'Found him at the Casablanca,' said Cutter, with a worried look in his eyes. "'Somebody shot out the light when the mix-up started. You know, I have a notion it was Moraga. He was in one of the little card rooms, putting on his shoes. I got his gun. He'd fired just one shot. The muzzle of it was bloody.' 
if he has told Galloway. But I don't believe he has. Strauff says that just as Norton started things, he saw a man run in from the cottonwoods and duck into the house. It was Strauff's job to see that nobody got out, and he let him go by. If it wasn't Moraga, who was it? And when I grabbed him just now, the first thing he said was, I want to talk to Galloway. You didn't let him, demanded Engle quickly. No, a couple of the boys have walked him off down the road. I've got Galloway and Antone in the jail. Now, what I want is some advice. What am I going to do with this job until Rob Norton comes to and takes a hand? If he ever does, he muttered heavily. It's clear that you've got to keep Moraga away from Galloway. If they haven't already had a chance to talk, it's pure godsend, and it's up to you that they don't get a chance. Yes, admitted Cutter slowly, but I'm the first man to admit I'm all mugged up. What did Moraga have his shoes off for? If he shot out the light, why did he do it? And how did he get blood on his gun? Engel shook his head. All questions for the district attorney later, Tom, he answered. But if you want any advice from me, here it is. Get Moraga out of the way on the jump. He is supposed to be in jail in the next county. He must have broken out. Send a man to Las Palmas to telephone the Sheriff Roberts. Send Moraga along with him. And whatever you do, keep Jim Galloway where you've got him. I think we've got our case against him tonight. That's what I've been thinking. I guess that's what Norton would do, eh? Sure of it, said Engel promptly. Find out if you can whether Moraga got a chance to talk with Galloway. I'm going back to the house to let my wife and Flory know what has happened. Engel hurried to his home, told what had happened, and leaving his wife anxious, his daughter weeping hysterically, returned to the hotel. I've done all that any one could do for him, said Patton, as though defending himself because of Norton's continued unconsciousness. He's in pretty bad shape, Engel. Oh, I guess I can pull him through, but at that it's going to be a close squeak. Luckily, I was right on hand, though. And he grew technical, spoke of blood pressures taken, of traumatism, superinducing prolonged coma, of this and that which made no impression on the banker. He mentioned two wounds, Engel reminded him, the one made by the bullet and another by his head striking as he fell. Yes, that would have completed the work of the first shot in knocking him unconscious, but it is a negligible affair now. He wouldn't know anything about it in the morning if it weren't for the lump that'll be there. And since the other injury, the long gouging cut made by the bullet, has just plowed along the outer surface of the skull, I think that I can promise you he'll be all right pretty soon now. We ought to have some ice, but I've made cold compresses, too. Engle went again to look in upon Norton. The sheriff lay as before on his back, his limbs lax, his face deathly white. A bandage about his head. A lump came into the banker's throat, and he turned away. For he remembered that just so had Billy Norton lain. That Billy Norton had never regained consciousness, and that the blow then, as now, had been struck by Galloway or Galloway's man. The sudden fear was upon him that Rod Norton was even more badly hurt than Cato Patton admitted. The fear did not lessen as the night drew on and finally brightened into another day. When the sun flared up out of the flatlands lying beyond Tecolot, the wounded man at Strove's hotel lay as he had done all night, giving no sign to tell whether he was life's or death's. End of chapter 12